It's not calling you Josh Frydenberg, it's calling you Dosh Frydenberg. Under the coalition, taxes for hard-working Australians will always be lower. You know, I, I don't hold a hose, mate, and I, I don't sit your control room. They're answers that only can come from Victoria, I'm afraid, because that's not my job. But I ain't spending any time, though, because in the meantime, every three months, a person is torn to pieces by a crocodile in North Queensland. Well, g'day listeners and welcome once again to the Two Jacks. We're on episode 68 here and uh, that's our uh, podcast, our history of podcasts where we combine matters, Australian political and media and then have a good look around the world to see what's going on. Uh, it is Easter uh, Easter Tuesday. It used to be a public holiday as we record this. Um, but uh, isn't any more. We hope you all had a wonderful Easter. Joining me, as usual, is Jack uh, all the way in Hong Kong. Hong Kong Jack, g'day, mate. How are you? I'm good. Uh, happy Trans Day of Visibility to you. So, well, that was, uh, I think that was Sunday, wasn't it? It was Sunday. It was Sunday. I, I, I was explaining this to my wife and son, and they said, Dad, you've got to keep up. Yeah, come on, mate. Well, you you had uh, your uh, uh, number one male child uh, visiting you over the over the weekend. Um, how did all that go? All good? Yes, excellent to see him. And probably a few tears shed uh, as the Tigers ran over the top of uh, Sydney uh, on the Sunday. Um, well, we, we, we were watching it on our phones um, uh, because it, it didn't actually make the ABC TV guy. Um, uh, uh, well, never mind. We'll out. get to the AFL. That was one of the shock results of the weekend, and there were a number. But uh, we want to kick off today talking about the future of the coalition, or most properly, the electoral future of the Liberal Party. Um, uh, Simon Benson uh, wrote... Uh, over the weekend on an analysis of the news poll. He says, the clock is now ticking for the coalition. He said, while Liberal leader Peter Dutton has made incremental gains over the past 22 months, it is nowhere near enough. The 6% swing against federal labour in Western Australia is significant but unsurprising, considering the departure of Mark McGowan and the high water mark Labor achieved at the last election. That's all very sensible analysis. Um he basically saying that this 4852 cannot be broached at the moment. Uh, that's where the polling tells us uh, we're at. Labor 52, Coalition 48. Um, and, and there follows a piece in, uh, it's the New Daily, wasn't it? Yeah, it's from the New Daily, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and that was out this morning. So we did want to talk about this too. Um, uh, they have... The Liberal Party has particular problems with women and uh, a number of academics were interviewed for the New Daily article. Uh, Rod Tiffin, Emeritus Professor in Government at the University of Sydney, said the Liberal Party's rhetoric has pushed women away from the party. Uh, there was a time, he said, during the 60s and the Menzies era when women were far more likely to vote Liberal than men, and he's quite right about that. Um, it has is, is ceased to be. And when we look at uh, the sort of demographics in the last federal election, uh, professional women uh, were voting about one in six for the coalition, so around about 16%. Very, 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 very small figures. Um, you would think, Jack, with a, with an opposition only four points behind, that they're actually in not a bad position to strike at the next federal election, um, but... There are these problems. There are these continued problems with the Liberal Party and how it's perceived by the electorate, the electorate particularly women, um, that will keep them could keep them out of power forever. Um, I never say forever. Uh, I look at it from. Uh, you, they're right about the women, uh, professional women, um, uh, and they're right that women used to vote Liberal, and, and part of the reason for that was the old Labor Party was a very, very blokey environment indeed, um, uh, not the least bit welcoming to women. Um, and the Liberal Party, by contrast, was more welcoming. Um, and that situation's probably reversed to, a, to, a, to, a, to some degree at least. Um, I look at the Liberal Party and say, well, the low watermark was the Aston by-election. Um, uh, that was the... Uh, the final report card on the last on their last years in government, 
and they've made a reasonably good recovery since then to be back in a competitive 52-48 position. That's pretty good, but I don't think it's a winning position by any means. And if Simon Benson thinks that a, a pass card for an opposition leader in th- these circumstances is to win the next election, then I think he's kidding himself. Um, uh, we don't normally turf a government af- out after one term, um, and the chances of winning this are pretty slim. But Dutton's job, if you like, um, uh, is to – he's probably not going to be there. He might he may well – he, he may, not, may well not be the person who brings them back into into office, um, but his job is to make them competitive again, and that he has done. Yeah, uh, I get that too. But at the same time, Jack, I mean, you know, I, I think we'd be unwise to look uh, at any political party, regardless of size, and say that it has a future, uh, that it is owed a future, and it, and it and it isn't. I mean, what this polling tells us is that they might pick up two in WA, they might pick up two in New South Wales, um, but pretty much it's um, uh, uh, status quo from there. That might just push uh, Albanese into um, into a minority government situation. That would, that would be a pretty good result for the Libs. The other way of looking at things is if they fare really poorly at the next federal election, another sort of swing against them, then I don't know what what future they have. I mean, they would have a future that would last at least another three years. But if you continue to have bad results um, and um, – then, then really, um, you can see the thing crumbling. Um, it, it's already in a very weak position in Victoria. Um, I mean, almost non-existent in liberal in in Western Australia. Um, uh, it, it the LNP uh, will uh, probably win the Queensland election if we want to speculate. Um, but the Nats will take that, or the national element of the LNP will take that as a victory. Um, and Queensland, and- Queensland, of course, is the most unusual of the Australian states in the sense that the majority of the population don't live in a capital city. That's right. Yeah, so it's the most decentralised uh, state in the uh, Commonwealth. Um, but like I say, it, another, you know, they've lost power in like, in, in New South Wales. Uh, they're a basket case in, uh, in Victoria. They're pretty much a basket case. We haven't even touched on the Dunstan by-election in our pods, Jack, but... That was a shocking result, um, the, and, and this was this was after an you know I mean let let's be honest about Alex Antic, who who leapt to the top of the federal Senate ticket uh, is is a wacko you know I mean he's a, a an anti vaxxer and um, uh, and and. and you know, sort of has some mad theories, and he's sitting on top of a ticket in what is really a progressive state. Anne Rustin, who is the person with the ability, has been pushed down to number two. There was nothing in it other than, other than uh, those supporters of Alex Antic uh, wanted him to be on num- number one on the ticket. That's a real bad look. Mm. And then we look at Dunstan, which was a Liberal held seat. Now it's gone with a massive swing against them. Yeah, these they can't continue. This is the problem, Jack. They can't continue to put up one blokes and two extremists uh, <coughs> or hard right people because they simply won't get the following that they need in our cities uh, to win elections that way, and they seem incapable of changing that. Um, good old Robert Gottliebson in this morning's uh, uh, Australian, nice bloke. Um, you were in Melbourne many years ago. Um, uh, he raised an interesting point about the pre-selection of Tim Wilson in the seat of Goldstein. Yeah, uh, we talked Brighton. about that last week. Yeah, um, and, and, and he said that, look, that, that's an error. He said, I can see why the Liberals, he's got some talent, Tim Wilson, why they want him back in the Parliament, but he's never going to win Goldstein because that's full of um, uh, of professional women, etc. Uh, and they had, a, they had an excellent professional woman candidate to stand against Zoe Daniel, um, and they didn't. They that you know, that, that they chose Tim Wilson. Not um, a bad uh, decision. And, and and a bad decision. So they've got a lot of cleaning up to do in as to how they go about doing these things. But you know this happens in political parties. There there are 
in a, in a constant process of renewal. I've watched that happen in the Labor Party over the years. Um, there are always things that need cleaning up, and that's where they're the particularly are. resistant to quotas. Uh, they've yeah. been resistant to quotas, and 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 Labor have had quotas in since I'm going to say about 2007. Yeah, well, they, but Labor needed to have quotas really badly at the it time. It was a bloke's party, it wasn't was it? A, it was a very blokey party um, mm. uh, in those days. Yeah. Um, and, and and what they've seen with you know almost twenty years of um, of of that um, uh, is that they've got really as many women as they've got men in the parliament. Um, mm. uh, women are, I think, are even overrepresented in the cabinet. Um, and this is what a lot of women voters are, are actually looking for. Uh, they may not be um, uh, given to shifting their vote from Liberal to Labor, but they're not going to vote Liberal while they continue to pre-select poor candidates uh, and and push forward sort of extremists. They, the, the, the best example I can think of think of here was a few state elections ago in Victoria where um, the Libs ran this sort of um, <coughs> crime, anti-crime or, the you know, thing, things are out of control type issue, um, uh, African crime gangs, all this sort of nonsense. And, in fact, Scott Morrison and Peter Dutton contributed to that rhetoric. Uh, and along came Dan Andrews, who people weren't terribly fond of, but he said, this is what we've done, this is what we're going to do, and this is how we're going to get there. And people think, okay, to the point where the Libs almost lost Brighton, you know, um, and, 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 and so you just get the mood of the electorate wrong, particularly if you play these culture war games. Well, you can get the middle electorate of the electorate wrong for all sorts of reasons. Um, it's it's you need someone sensible um, uh, as your spokesperson. You know, Chris Minns is off to a pretty good start in New South Wales. Mike Baird before him was pretty good. Um, uh, for the other side, um, and you know, yeah, that's what you need. You need someone, who, particularly in state a state level, you need someone who can communicate well with the wide electorate. Yeah, oh, look, I, I don't think they've uh, got a real problem. There, a speakman, Mark Speakman, is the opposition leader. Um, he's a moderate, uh, sensible enough, uh, does all he can. If you're Peter Dutton, your leader of the opposition, you might have two minutes a day to make a point um, mm. in the media. Um, someone like Mark Speakman's probably going to be a bit less, uh, sometimes nothing. Mm. Um, but, you know, um, I, but you've got to, be ready, got, to, got, got to be ready to bat when the chance comes, right? Well, what we're seeing, I mean, basically, before the next federal election, unless there is another intervention from the from the uh, from the senior members of the federal parliamentary party, like Peter Dutton, it will be the first time that um, uh, that the party will pre-select their own candidates, and you just know that that's going to be messy. It should be messy, by the way, um, but. If there's another federal intervention, it will mean that really for the last 12 years, um, the Liberal Party have not allowed their branches to be involved in pre-selection. Yeah. Can we just go back to the federal level for a minute? Um, uh, Dutton, I think, has done a fair job of making them at least competitive. Um, uh, uh, the Labor government has wasted um, what should have been they should have a commanding lead still. They were a long, long way in front at the Aston by-election and they've frittered a fair bit of that away because they're looking untidy um, uh, and they and, and Albanese personally invested a hell of a lot in the voice and lost uh, and those things have brought them back to the pack. Well, it's not as if they're brought back to the pack, Jack. So this 52-48 is where we landed. At the last yeah, federal and, election, they were, they were a, lot, a lot better off than, uh, off than that at the Aston by-election, uh, and they've come back to where they were when they were first elected. That's but, where they are. And this is this is Simon Benson's point that they can't seem to break break uh, clear any further. And so there are these but I, but, issues. But I think Simon's wrong about this. I wouldn't have been expecting them to break through and win back government in one in one uh, term. Well, even even if you if you're right that the Albanese government's been untidy. And it has on occasion, so I fully accept that. But uh, what we would, what we might normally see, uh, let's look at two thousand and seven, or indeed twenty thirteen, uh, you will see the the party in government languishing in the polls, behind 
um, at this sort of uh, uh, at, at this sort of uh, point in the uh, electoral cycle. Um, and that just doesn't seem to be it. I mean, the Liberal Party. Let's get this right. The Liberal Party cannot win government unless it start unless its primary votes around forty percent. Mm. It can't win a thirty six, thirty seven. It just can't. And that seems to be where they're locked in. Mm. There's a whole raft of right wing parties, small minor parties, single issue parties to their right. And, the, and what we've seen in state and federal elections recently is that they're not preferencing back. And we could even look at something like Paul Enhancer's One Nation Party who preference to the Libs if, with their 3 or 4% of the vote, who preference to the Libs at about a rate of about 65-35, whereas Labor's relationship with the Greens gets them 90-10. Um, and so part of the problem is you, you do have these right-wing extreme groups who have very little faith. There's also some organisational issues there, handing out how-to-vote cards and things like that for small parties just doesn't work. Uh, well, well, they just don't have the numbers to do it uh, in, in, in many electorates, even though they might put forward a candidate. Um, so what we, what we see is that... We, we used to solve that problem uh, back in the Labor Party. Help them out. Uh, if the de- Take if the, the red t-shirt off. If, if the, if the de- Democrats or the um, uh, uh, whatever they were called in those days didn't have enough uh, people on the ground, we would find them for them. They, 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 <laughs> yeah, take the red t-shirt off and put this one on. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so, so yeah, the, I, I think that's that's the real big problem for them that they are not generating enough. Um, uh, support, preferential support from uh, m- uh, minor uh, and one um, uh, one issue parties to their right, um, and that's a big problem. One thing that I think will, will may have a big uh, impact on the election, Jack, is whether the UAP decides to run again with the same extent, or the, the, you know they had one hundred and fifty one candidates. I think they mm-hmm. might have had to flick a couple before the election, but but near enough to a, to one in every party. But if Clive says, "Nah, I don't want to worry about this," uh, then you'll find that maybe some of that vote will come back. Could do. Uh, I, I just look at it this way: when Dutton took the job, um, anyone with any understanding of political history would know that he had um, very very little chance of ever becoming prime minister. If you, if you were appointed leader of the opposition following a defeat. Um, almost none of them have become prime minister um, in those circumstances. No, that's so, fair. Yeah, I'd so, also so, say so. His his job his job is to take them back into the contest. Um, uh, and 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 the, the election day wasn't the low point. That was about Aston by election um, when the when the when the people realise just how bad Morrison's government had been, and when they when they were surprised at just how good the Albanese government got off to a start, a good start. Um, now, his job has been to make them competitive, and that he has done, but he's unlikely to be, um, not even Moses got to Jerusalem. He's not likely to lead them back into the promised land. Um, uh, uh, yeah. But um, if he makes it com- makes them competitive and someone else can come along and stand on his shoulders and win, he will have done his job. Yeah, um, look, I'll, I'll look at, I'll take the other, I'll take the other pathway, that if they have another bad result in the forthcoming federal election in 2025, if uh, elbow goes all the th- goes the three years, um, uh, then then three years down the track becomes existential uh, for the Liberal Party. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that's, so that, that depends what they do after the election. Oh yeah, there's a there's a lot of things that can, but but if you have another bad one, and then and then you'll be looking at the third one, saying, well, this is this this could be it. Um, and, and we know how quickly it can happen. Not that I'm talking about overwhelming labour uh, numbers in in the uh, in the lower house, but what we're talking about is an expansion of of the crossbench uh, at the cost of the Liberal Party. And if the Liberal Party turns up uh, in the next Parliament uh, with a couple of cricket teams, then they've got big big problems. All right. Um, all stuff to uh, to uh, keep in mind as we uh, continue along in the electoral cycle. Um, major uh, controversy and move, Jack, in the Lamon v Channel 10 and Wilkinson case. 
uh, in a dramatic last-minute move. This was announced over the Easter weekend. The 10 Network has launched an urgent application asking the federal court to reopen its case in the defamation action brought against it by Bruce Learman after it received new information from former Stephen, sorry, former Seven producer Taylor Allback. Um, he has prepared, that is Taylor, who is, I'm told, currently in New Zealand and will not be available for uh, uh, for uh, uh, well, to, to, to give evidence in the federal court, initially anyway, has preferred, prepared an affidavit uh, which uh, indicates that uh, Bruce Lehrman may have lied under oath, Jack, in evidence that he gave to the court. Um, uh, specifically, that he may have, that, that Lehrman may have breached what they call the Harmon undertaking, which is that so the police gave um, uh, Lehrman access to some of the material that was used in the Spotlight program. Um, Seven have always said it didn't come from Lehrman, um, uh, but they got it from other sources. Um, and the Harmon undertaking says that if you're given um, uh, access to that sort of material, uh, by the police as part of the prosecution of you, you cannot use it outside of that court case, outside of that of that prosecution. You can't use it for other purposes. Mm. It's from a from a British ruling, I think, um, ah. um, and, um, and but but has been accepted by the High Court and, and adapted to some extent by the High Court. And this would be a serious matter because you know um, uh, to be in breach of a Harmon undertaking is a is a contempt uh, uh, charge. Um, Possibility, um, a, 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 a contempt, or, or um, uh, is it contempt, or is it uh, um, um, giving false evidence, Jack? Um, well, 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 it, it may be it may perjury. Be both. So I, yeah, I should yeah, have yeah, said yeah, perjury. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it may be both, um, mm. but it certainly could be could be a contempt charge in the ACT. Um, well, here's Stephen Rice today. Uh, Stephen Rice in the Australian today. He's been following this case very very closely and uh, it's many, it's myriad it's myriad cases all around it um he says that justice lee has not changed he noted that uh, justice lee has not changed the date of judgment day which is which is uh, thursday which is still listed for thursday of this week we uh, we should be out uh out to you by then listeners um that'll be the 4th of april uh, and that uh, Justice Lee has already read our backs affidavit as the Channel 7 producer. He insisted on reading it before agreeing to the interlocutory hearing, and that move could suggest that whatever claims our back has made, and this is speculation from Ricey, uh, whatever claims our back has made about Lehman, Lee doesn't think they will significantly alter his pre-written judgment. That's speculation, so it, it may be different. Um, and I... <laughs> there were certainly indications uh, in, uh, that uh, uh, Justice Lee regarded uh, both um, uh, Brittany Higgins and uh, and Bruce Lehrman as unreliable witnesses or witnesses who had um, uh, uh, not not uh, not been frank uh, with their evidence uh, throughout the defamation trial. Jack. As, a, as a friend of mine put it, um, uh, the one thing we can be absolutely sure about from uh, from that situation following the, the two cases is that you wouldn't believe either of them. Yeah, well, there were significant holes in that judgment. But did, this has got a bit of the QB, uh, I, think I used to call it because I was a kid, it used to sit in our letterbox. <laughs> Sorry, it used to sit in our, book, uh, our, our uh, bookcase. Uh, Leon Uris is QB7. I used to call it QBV2, QB, QBVI, v, VII. Um, um, but the, the Queen, Queen's Bench 7, yes, yeah. Uh, and do you remember Do you remember the book? Oh, was, yeah, vaguely, yeah. Yeah, look, uh, the ultimate was that the, um, uh, that the sewer, the person who had sued for defamation, was, um, uh, was a bit of an under, underhand character, uh, but he won his case on the law but was given... Uh, damages, I think, of uh, well, it's some hypens, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, uh, 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 damages of a derisory hypen, amount. Yeah, yeah, uh, that, uh, that is, sort of thing is normally called in the law reports. Um, that's entirely possible. Um, yeah, uh, um, um, I, I don't think Lerman's going to lose the case because I don't think that 
um, you know, my own. I don't know. I didn't see it all, but I saw a fair bit of it. Um, I don't think there's enough material to say that um, uh, uh, a sexual assault or a rape actually occurred. Um, uh, but you know, but I, I, I don't look, think I, I don't think he's going to believe. I don't I, think he's going to believe. Um, I saw uh, a lot I, of it too. Uh, missed some of it. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, having having a chat with friends. Uh, a couple of weekends ago, we sort of all came up with the same uh, view that just exactly like yours that that, that um, Channel Ten uh, and and Wilkinson have been uh, have 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 not been able to to prove uh, that the act- that the rape actually occurred. Um, <clears throat> I think that's kind of where we are, but but where our backs affidavit fits in is anyone's guess, but. It would seem to be. I mean, basically, one thing that can happen is a Bruce Lerman will be called to give further evidence, and uh, and be cross examined uh, about the contents of that uh, affidavit. I don't know about our back and where he is. He's in New Zealand apparently, but he may be subject to give evidence under oath, um, and uh, and be cross examined as well. But uh, as Ricey points out, on Thursday is still listed as judgment day. Yeah, there's not a lot of time to do this, and it may well be that Justice Lee has formed an opinion about Bruce Lehman, uh, and that may well affect his damages claim. He might end up with Tuppence Hapney, Jack. He might. The um, at the very beginning of this, uh, you and I, I think we're in agreement that um, Lehman just shouldn't have done this. Just just shouldn't have sued. Right? The uh, do we call it? We, we, we better update it. We call it the Jack Elliott rule. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and uh, just when you when you're out of the shit, uh, be thankful rather than uh, get on, get on rather than go on some uh, civil civil legal escapade that will throw open uh, all of your many character flaws uh, and uh, and rather shabby history. Um, and uh, we could also call that the Ben Robert Smith yeah. um, and, uh, argument or the, and, and- <laughs> the phenomenon. And I think we were spot on in that. Uh, in fact, the only people, the only, <coughs> two, the only two people um, who I would consider have had a win with the Lerman v. Um, uh, Channel 10 and Wilkinson case. I can certainly think of Chan- one winner. Certainly <laughs> Channel 10 um, uh, um, uh, have had a, a loss with this. Their reputation uh, um, has not been enhanced, nor has Lisa Wilkinson, nor has Brittany Higgins, nor has Bruce Lerman. Um, uh, the only that, the only two people I think who come out of this better are Linda Reynolds uh, and her chief of staff Fiona Brown. I think um, Fiona Brown's come out of this quite well, and, and Linda Reynolds too. Yeah, they're, but they're, they're the only, they're the only two winners. Everybody else is a loser in this. Oh, there's one you're missing, Jack. There's one you're missing. Who am I missing? The lawyers. Oh well. Yeah, I mean, this no, is this isn't a lawyer's picnic. This is a lawyer's smorgasbord with full carvery privileges. It is. Uh, Josh Bordstein was was using your your phrase about that on Twitter the other day, um, uh, and he was attributing all of that to Bruce Lerman. And I say, well, you, you couldn't forget Shane Drumgold's contribution to it as well. <laughs> He's also been a major contributor. Perhaps not best on ground, but um, yeah. you know, he got him. Got in, in there the and got a few hard balls. Yeah, he'd be in the votes. You know, he'd be in the votes. Yeah, exactly right. Okay, look, let's let's have a look at uh, another issue that we've been discussing uh, with our listeners, and this is uh, where we at, we are at the point now where Labor has introduced legislation. It went through the lower house and then got knocked back in the Senate, uh, and this is uh, well in regard to the High Court decision that said you cannot detain people uh, forever. And so these these people who are problematic, uh, some of them with criminal, criminal histories, had to be released. So you could, uh, you, could, you, could, you could only detain people for the purposes of deportation. If it became apparent that deportation was not possible or was not um, possible in the foreseeable future, then you had to release them. Yes, and, and some of these people, <coughs> let, let's, let's just try and get this explained properly. Some of these people, for example, there was one, for example, who's been charged with 
a, a murder in a in a in, in another country and a country that has the death penalty uh, as uh, as a as a sanction for murder. Um, and so, under our treaty obligations, that person cannot be deported to that country. Mm. There are other countries that are determined to be unsafe, uh, and uh, and um, uh, that would be because the applicants determine that they are going to suffer some form of political persecution or persecution of some description, and so they can't be deported. Um, well, can I, can I just stop you there. Most of the, almost all of these people. Have um, have run run that argument before the government, the tribunals, and the courts, and lost. Yes. Yes. Um, so there's a lot of conflating of this um, in the media. I saw um, what's her name um, Ferguson on the seven thirty report relitigating um, uh, a um, an applicant's claim for asylum in Australia, which has failed. Um, uh, and she was sort of saying, well, he says he's going to be persecuted if he goes back to, I can't remember which country it was, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but at some point, don't we have to say, well, look, you've put that argument and it hasn't succeeded? Yeah, look, I understand that, but we're just trying to create some context on how this all took place. Um, and so we have people sitting really in a state of, um, what would you call it, almost purgatory, Jack, a sort of existential yeah. purgatory. Yeah. While, they, while they were detained, are no longer. They are out in the community now after the High Court's determination. Um, uh, and so those people, for whatever reason, cannot be deported um, <coughs> um, uh, or, 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 well, then we get around to Labor's uh, laws, which say they can be. Now, my point, Jack, is whatever legislation they've come up with, including this, and you can walk through it in a minute, I don't think it's going to survive a High Court challenge. Uh, probably not. What they're saying is um, we want to be able to um, detain people if they, uh, in fact, to, to, you know, to detain them for a number of years if they refuse to cooperate. So what happens with the, what has happened with a number of these cases is that people don't have, say, a current passport, right, right. Um, which would enable them to be deported, and the, and and the government says, well, you've got to apply for your passport so we so you can go back because you have failed in your application to stay in Australia. And let's say you're from Iran. Yeah, and and so you what say, you, what's the likelihood of you getting your passport? Um, uh, generally reasonably good, I think. Um, okay. Um, well, you know these things and I don't. Um, I would have thought some of these countries at least would say, what, who's this guy again? Yeah, and, and that may happen, but it's a case-by-case case thing. Um, but the, the government is saying, well, you have to cooperate um, and, and, and getting a passport may be, may be part of it, maybe not, um, but you have to cooperate um, in, in leaving the country, otherwise we're going to detain you. You can't just go on strike, uh, if you like, and stay in Australia because you won't cooperate. Mm. Um, what is the ch- – well, you, you've already sort of answered that. There, there, there would obviously be a High Court challenge yes. uh, towards this legislation. As as it stands, uh, the Liberals voted for it in the lower house and when it got to the Senate, they sat with the Greens and knocked it back, which is unusual, shall we say. Uh, and we might sort of wonder about the political motives there, but because this is kind of a win for – for the for the Liberal Party or for the coalition, uh, while matters remain unsolved, you talked about well, it, well, it, it sort of splits the Labor Party on this because the Labor Party is split on this kind of issue. So um, that's kind of a win for a short term political win for them, but that's kind of irrelevant. It's gone off to a Senate committee now um, to be discussed, um, and it, these are these are tricky things to fix. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, there, there, there are no easy legislative solutions. No. Um, uh, and the politics of it are probably running um, the Liberals' way, in, in part because Claire O'Neill and Andrew Giles are making such a pig's breakfast of, um, of, of arguing their case. Uh, well, I think Giles' performance has been exceedingly poor. I wouldn't put um, the uh, Home Affairs Minister in the same basket, but um, uh, he'd been exceedingly poor and, and seemed not to be across his brief. I mean, yes, this is a sort of running sore, um, and, um, and 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 they just seem, well, Giles in particular, seemed to be very, very slow on the uptake. I mean, there are so many things that could have been done in regard to these people being in the community, some of them 
as we know, have gone on to commit criminal offences. Others have been alleged to have commit them, committed them, but found not to have. Um, but there's, there's, there's so much that existing law would have allowed Giles Department to do, to, to uh, cooperate with state and federal law enforcement, things like ankle bracelets, things like monitoring, um, uh, you know, these things should have been done immediately. And so it just seemed to me that he was very a long way from his brief at the time. And, yeah. and the time being when 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 the high court uh, uh, when the high court handed down his verdict. Yeah, um, uh, he's been by far the worst performance, but she hasn't been very good either. Yeah, look, it it is a mess, uh, and it, and I don't think that whatever they have sort of uh, cobbled together is is going to pass a is going to pass the high court test and that means we'll be back where we started in a couple of years time even if this legislation gets through yeah um, uh, generally these things are got to be fixed in a more ad hoc way um, uh, person by person all right now prime minister anthony albanese and, and climate change and energy minister chris bowen have been questioned for their use of two separate private jets to fly to the hunter valley last week and it takes an hour on the road mate uh, uh, well, from, from Western Canberra, Sydney, from, from Canberra, it's a bit longer. Oh, Hunter Valley's yeah, well, hour and a half, hour and a half in the car from Sydney. Um, it, it just just was one of those things because it was oh, a, be- look, a, be- a beautiful oh, photo, a beautiful photo of two um, uh, glistening jets, jets sitting side by side at the airport at Scone. Um, uh, um, when they're up there to make an announcement to fight climate change. Uh, yeah, look, these arguments are, are, are thrown around a fair bit. Um, uh, even if and, they park, even if they know, park- who, who catches a who catches a, a private jet and how many flights and all this sort of stuff. And, yeah, and but um, if only they parked weak. them. If only they'd parked them at opposite ends of the runway. It yeah. Might have yeah. What are the pilots thinking? Here you've got these two glistening jets uh, side by side. Yeah, probably not a great look. Um, <coughs> they are. are uh, well, no, uh, they, they're, they're RAAF jets, Jack. So they yes. uh, would have had the imprimatum over a couple of missiles on uh, on the wings. But, um, yeah, look, not a good look, but... Um, I think this is pretty tedious. I did notice uh, my, my good mate Ben Fordham uh, chucked this one up, uh, I think, yesterday, and um, and uh, that's his job. I'll put it at that. That's, mm. his, that's his job and he's doing it well. Oh, well, look, if, he, if, if you were doing a morning radio program and someone put this on your desk, you're saying, we're running with this. You know. Other news, uh, in what was probably a, a pretty ordinary site, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and Climate Change and Energy Minister Chris Bowen have been questioned for the use of two separate private jets, RAAF jets, it must be said, um, found sitting next to each other, uh, at the Scone Airport, Jack, in the Hunter Valley last week. Yes, and as they had gone up to uh, to fly into Scone to uh, announce something with a um, a climate change aspect to it, um, uh, the, the, the sight of the two separate private jets um, uh, standing, standing side by side at Scone Airport caused some um, uh, hilarity around the place. Yes, they were there to announce the Solar Sunshot program. Jack, they should have had a couple of uh, solar panels on the jets, maybe. Um, mm. Suck it all in. Suck on. It was a beautiful sunny weekend. Yeah. Um, although they were there earlier in the week last week. They, they, this story came about through radio host Ben Ford. I'm at uh, 2GB. Uh, I, uh, Ben's a good mate of mine. And uh, all I'll say there is it wrong? Is it? Ben Fordham's doing his job properly. Oh, um, look, if you, if you were Ben Fordham and this was on your desk when you arrived early in the morning to do your breakfast radio program, you'd be saying, we're doing this. This yeah, is yeah, a great this, story. This, yeah. We're kicking off. We're kicking off with this one. Yeah. Um, look, it is a bit tedious, I must say, you know, when we start looking at uh, when we start looking at politicians and uh, um, um, so even celebrities and their use of private jets while they're uh, – and talking about climate change, it all gets a bit tedious. But it wasn't, it must be said, much of a look. Um, uh, we did have Scott Morrison, Jack. Every time that man's name is mentioned in the public forum, must send a shiver down the spine of the Liberal Party or the, 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 the senior folk in the Liberal Party. He turned up on a podcast and he said, humility keeps you real. Mm. Uh, now he said, I, 
a former PM who took on an five extra minutes in secret tells Olympian Sam Fricker that listeners might say, oh, I don't think you were that humble. Yeah, I'm pretty much sure that's that's going to be, well, it's probably going to be a little bit more vociferous than that. Um, uh, was he a humble man? I, I never got that impression, Jack. Uh, there are very few people who get to a senior position in politics who could be described as humble. <laughs> he, but he regarded it. He regarded humility as something, you know, it was a, as a key teaching in his Christian faith, Jack. Mm. So I guess it's all it all depends on who you humble with. So when you're on on the knees, genuflecting uh, to the to the heavens, he might think he was a very humble man in front of. Uh, a vast, fierce, um, omni, uh, omnipotent uh, um, deity. Uh, but when it came to his colleagues, Jack, perhaps not so humble. Um, at the time he left office, or um, lost office, um, a lot of the criticism of him was that he was power-hungry and a bit of an egomaniac. And everything we've learned about him since he lost the election <laughs> um, uh, has, that. Just, has just franked that. Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. Not a lot of humility there. Um, that was the great uh, comment that he made in the ABC um, and the ABC documentary um, uh, that um, Nemesis, it was called, that uh, he, uh, he 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 continued to love the Australian people, but. Perhaps they didn't feel quite the same way at the moment. No. And I think that's about right. He got that one right. Um, meanwhile, Jack, has, uh, has Kevin Rudd, uh, has he got on the phone to the to the Trumpster and said, I'm sorry, has he got on the phone and said, can I meet with uh, maybe Junior and Eric and uh, we'll see what we can sort out? Yeah, um, I actually rather like this little thing on Twitter. Um, uh, it was, was talking about that issue and says, Trump is an egomaniac. He is vindictive. He never forgets a grudge. He is prepared to destroy his own party and paralyse his country to further his ambitions. Hmm. But look on the positive side, Kevin. You and he have much in common. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit. That's a bit rough on Kevin. Um, but oh, I don't know. Well, he is. Look, he, you know, Trump is. <laughs> see, I honestly don't think uh, Donald Trump knew who Kevin Rudd was. Uh, up until about uh, up until about two weeks ago. Oh, I know. Uh, I thought, uh, and now he as, does. As soon as he used the word nasty, um, uh, some people tell me he's nasty. I thought he's been speaking to some of Kevin's colleagues. <laughs> well, you might say so, but he was given the he was given the um, uh, the, the 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 handball uh, from Farage, and um, yeah, it was uh, Joe the Goose sort of job, you know. So very easy for him to respond to that. I mm-hmm. guess there are issues. Uh, that might prevail if uh, Kevin Rudd uh, does find himself as uh, our ambassador to the United States and Donald Trump is elected later on this year. I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I'm told... That's, that's kind of unimportant. Um, uh, we, Australia would need to make its assessment as to who the right person exactly in the right. job is. It's our, it's um, our job. It, yeah. It's our job and our responsibility to work through that and... Uh, um, but look, I, I, I can say, you know, having chatted to a few people about this in recent times, Kevin Rudd's actually done a lot of work to reach out to the Republican Party mm. uh, because he understands that this is an election year and it could go either way and the, the, the makeup of the Congress could be very different. Um, and, uh, and so he's actually done a little bit of work. I mean, these comments that he made, they were made outside of his, uh, you know, before he became the ambassador. So, you know, everyone's entitled to their opinion. It, it, it was just, you know, we having a bit of free speech, Jack, or? or oh, no, you know? you, you're, you're perfectly entitled to your opinion. Exactly right. um, it, it just It just mightn't guarantee you the job that you want. And look, a little bit of a quirky job here, but uh, Telstra is saying that uh, 15,000 pay phones on street, I haven't seen one. I haven't seen a pay phone in years. A lot of them are out in the boondocks, but uh, Australians can now use all of our 15, or all of Telstra's 15,000 pay phones on street corners and in tiny towns uh, free. International yeah, call, I- calls you know, to make ring up their mates in... Uh, in Norway, no, uh, just, just just Australian calls. I think yeah. um, the um, uh, it, it was taking me back to, I guess, my early twenties when 
Um, we didn't, couldn't get the phone on because Telstra Telecom was so slow. Uh, and uh, the communication with the, the parents would have been the PMG back in those days, wouldn't it, Jack? No, I'm not quite that old. Um, but the communication with the parents was to um, walk down to the local post office and call them on the on the on the payphone. Um, it's almost inconceivable now to think about that, isn't it? Um, yeah, it is. Um, and um, I guess vandalism's down too, Jack, because that's just the other thing. You know, you, if you go to the payphone. With uh, with two bob in your hand, uh, you might find the thing had been wrenched off the uh, wrenched the off the the, the the headphones have been have been wrenched off. Yeah, we we have we have, Hong Kong has free local calls here, so that if you um, back in the days before everybody had a telephone uh, a personal phone, um, uh, the shops would have just a phone um, sitting near the door. You could go in and use their phone to ring home and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, look, a very serious story. The Alice Springs curfew, Jack. Uh, Two-week curfew for children under 18 in Alice Springs. It's only parts of Alice Springs, which I didn't know in the reporting. Um, Liam Mendes has done some terrific work for the Australian, just showing just how desperate um, the things are in Alice Springs in terms of youth crime um, and the response uh, from the NT government has been to implement, and I think in, in discussions with the Alice Springs Mayor, Matt, Matt Patterson, is to bring in this curfew uh, that uh, says, I think by 8 o'clock, everyone's supposed to be indoors. But it's only part of Alice Springs, Jack. Uh, I think it's what passes for a CBD in Alice Springs. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, they're, they're talking about it working in the suburbs but not outer Alice Springs. Um, uh, the independent MLA, Robin Lambley, said that the curfew in Alice Springs needed to be extended for at least three months and across the whole town. Um, Northern Territory Chief Minister Eva Lawler vowed to send 58 more police officers to clear kids into homes or government facilities between 6pm and 6am. I said 8 o'clock, 8pm, so I was wrong about that. Um, <coughs> uh, Action for Alice founder Darren Clark, I don't know if we want... Uh, to hear too much from him, but uh, he said there were no short-term solutions, which is probably right. Um, Darren Clark has been um, a recipient of uh, a great deal of uh, uh, Commonwealth money uh, and and territory money to to get his businesses up and running, and there's nothing wrong with that. He runs a bakery or runs a series of bakeries, I believe, um, that do employ Indigenous Australians, uh, and he finds that uh, his bakeries are often being broken into. Um, well, he's it, right. He's right about this. I don't think that there are no there are no, 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 no short term solutions. There, um, there, the, the, there are probably not too many long term solutions, Jack. No, but uh, I, I don't think a curfew is an entirely bad idea if it buys you a little bit of time. Yeah, that's kind of what it is, isn't it? Um, now, look, there there has been some success elsewhere, Jack, in terms of uh, remote and. Uh, uh, remote Indigenous populations, um, uh, and this was a um, policy put forward by uh, Mark McGowan uh, in uh, as Western Australian Premier. It's called Target One Twenty. You want to talk to me a little bit about it, Jack? Um, this is a, a, a program where they they basically appoint uh, government officials to sort of guide families, to help families, to be available for them all the time, um, just to help the kids get back into uh, education, uh, help them find a job, help them find somewhere to stay, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we, we have to fix those basic problems. Anthony Dillon, the Aboriginal commentator. And you, and you do need to start small, don't you? You do yeah. need to deal with that. So when we talk about Target 120, which is a sort of, you know, it's a, it was an individual thing. Yeah, so 120 families were identified mm. with individuals within them perceived to be at considerable risk, risk of incarceration, committing offences, um, uh, not going to school, those sorts of things. And 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 so the, the state of Western Australia put some extra time into those 120 families, extra time and resources. Uh, and so this is kind of minutia type policy creation, isn't it? You know, this is sort of working from the bottom up, and I think there's a fair bit to be said for it. It is. There is. And they have a community youth officer um, who who liaises uh, across uh, government departments with the families, 
Um, it seems to be if it, look. One thing you'd say if if you've got a model that works, let's try and let's try and apply it. I mean that it doesn't mean necessarily that what's go what has happened in Western Australia was effective will be effective in Alice Springs. You need to consider that. Um, but um, right. the curfew if, if, is if, only if, buying time, and then you've got to get back to dealing with the problem at it, at its source. As as Anthony Dillon said. Um, their difficulties, they have limited access to education and employment opportunities, modern services and safe homes in which to live. Yeah, You've got to address it. that. Um, and you know, maybe maybe it's time to find 50 or 100 families in Alice Springs and try with, try the, t- the 2120 with her. Yeah, look, one thing that Liam Mendes is reporting has is, is told me is that, the, is that while you've got kids as young as sort of 10, 11, 12 out sort of taking – you know, pinching cars and breaking into properties and so forth, and then terracing around the streets uh, in sort of terrifying ways, where where they're at actual risk of of suffering serious injury themselves. Um, what what you sort of think there is that, well, what Liam was reporting is that the families are, are absolutely agonised over what's going to become of their kids, and and they fear that they'll end up in the criminal justice system. And then we start the cycle all over again. And yeah. that's where you got to break it. You, 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 you got to keep kids out of jail. You just got to somehow uh, without giving them the sense that they can become utterly lawless, which oh. is a – I understand the inher- inherent contradiction there. Hmm. Um, yeah, these, are, these things are not easy um, uh, and – a lot of good people have spent a lot of time and a lot of money trying to fix them without any success. So, um, you know, just go into it knowing that's a possibility. All right. Very quickly now on to the United States, Jack. Uh, Trump uh, got a run on SNL. I think he does every week, doesn't he? He um, does but, now. Uh, the, 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 SNL I, I didn't re- see. It's geo-blocked in this country, SNL. Uh, SNL have, re, um, uh, have rediscovered humour after 10 or so years. Uh, this is rather good. Um, oh, uh, the- well, hang, on, hang on just a minute. So Will, uh, what's his name, Will, uh, I mean, some of the funniest people in in the country have been on that show for the last 10 years. But um, anyway. Yeah. Uh, so far as politics con- con- was concerned, they lost their sense of humour. The high watermark for me was the retirement of the end of um, – Barack Obama, where they sang um, uh, to Sir with love to him. Um, and for a comedy show, that's just dreadful. Um, the, uh, yeah, that does sound awful. Yeah, yeah it, it, it was pretty lame. Tina Fey was one of the ones singing it. It was embarrassing to watch. You can still find it on YouTube. Oh, no, uh, thank you. Um, the, um, they had a, a mock-up of The Last Supper and um, uh, yeah, people in costume, all that sort of stuff. And um, well, the apostles, uh, you mean? Yeah, yeah, Jesus and the apostles sitting at the table. You know, all looks like the, the painting of the Last Supper, and and in walks Trump in the suit, um, uh, and uh, and he's talking. He's explaining Easter to the to the, to the people at home, you know, on, on watching the television. Uh, and uh, it, it was it, the, 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 I can't think of the name of the fellow who plays Trump, but he's very very good. The mannerisms are. Pretty much spot on. Um, he needs to whack on about forty kilos, but you well, know, um, yeah. um, goes without saying to, to to get the Trump thing right. But he was very good. Uh, he said that uh, uh, that uh, he and Jesus had a lot in common. They were they were persecuted for no reason, um, uh, and that um, and that uh, Jesus was, was crucified, and uh, and. Came back from the dead three days later. He says, "I would have done it in two, probably, yeah, almost certainly." <laughs> yeah, and, that's uh, right. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he quite liked the idea of Good Friday, but if he were there, it would have been Great Friday. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "We could make Friday great again," you know, and, uh, and, and more of the same. So it was very, very good. Um, I'm so, I didn't know uh, uh, SNL was Joe Block in Australia. That's a shame because this is. Uh, the, yeah, look, it does appear on cable, but it's there's, there's always a bit of a delay. I think that's the way it works. I'm, I'm, I, I don't watch the show religiously, but they you know, they do. They do good, very. They do very good work, with the possible exception of to serve with love when Barack Obama um, um, uh, finished his second term. Um, uh, there was, of course, the Trump uh, Bible uh, being sold for sixty bucks 
um, yes. uh, plus shipping and handling. And, uh, and, and there was and, there was a further skit on that on, on SNL as well, which is quite good. Well, they the, the wonderful Brent Terhoon, who who does a magnificent. Um, uh, parody of Marga Hat people uh, and just basically films these as stand up comedian, does films these things in his car, big red beard, and uh, he really does look the part of a MAGA guy. Got the cap on, of course, got the red cap on. Um, he's and he he held uh, Trump's Bible up, I don't think it actually was, but um, uh, and uh, and he said, This is not ghost written. He said, This is holy ghost written. <laughs> but he also made the point that um, uh, that all other Bibles are now heresy. Uh, <laughs> and so, unless you've got a Trump up, and, and, and unless Brent to whom was just parroting way too far, I got the impression that the Trump Bible contains the Bible, Old and New Testaments, and um, uh, and also the American Constitution, uh, the Bill of Rights, and uh, I think that the uh, the Declaration of Independence and um, the Oath of Allegiance, Jack, in the same uh, publication, which does sound rather wonderful. So, so the poor people who produced the St. James Bible will be going out of business, will it? <laughs> well, either that or they continue to publish heretical texts. Mm. Um Israel and Gaza, Jack, uh, not so funny there. Um, uh, where are we now? Um, uh, the Israel, the, the IDF has been, um, uh, uh, well, the Israeli government has been gung ho on uh, getting into Rafa, but nothing's really happened yet, has it? No, it would seem not. Big protests in uh, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv uh, last night. Right. Uh, um, calling for. Uh, elections, they want to get rid of Bibi Netanyahu, um, right. and they also want all the hostages back. Any numbers? Uh, you could, did you remember any? I mean, uh, from- I, I only say, but while you think about it, the, uh, you know, in Tel Aviv in uh, January 2023, there were half a million people on the streets there. Yeah, they weren't, that big, but the, they weren't that big, but they were big enough. Hmm. Um, um, I don't think that the, there is a, the political will to have an election until the war is over. When they do, though, that Netanyahu will, I think, certainly lose. Very interesting um, that there is this uh, bit of an uprising, at least, of people disaffected by, in, in Israel, of people, people disaffected by the government of Bibi Netanyahu. Um all right, uh, just uh, just have a look at this. In De- De- December, support for armed resistance uh, against across the Palestinian territories was 63, 68 in the West Bank. So that's December of last year, within Israel, by the way. 68% in the West Bank and 56% in the Gaza Strip. Latest polling showed support for armed resistance at 46 across the Palestinian territories, 51 in the West Bank and 39% in the Gaza Strip. Those are Big, big declines, Jack. Hmm. Uh, and not the polling. Polling's not going to solve you too many problems, um, but it is a reflection uh, that there is a, a major shift within Israel among the Israeli people um, uh, for further conflict in Gaza. Um, yeah, I don't think that. I, I don't think there is a, a shift. Um, uh, uh, Away well, those, amongst, those, amongst the Israelis people. Those numbers these, are pretty significant, Jack. These are these are these, these are these are Palestinian votes. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I do apologise. So, yeah. so um, yeah. So, what we're talking to the latest polling show support for armed resistance. Ah, I do apologise. Sorry, listeners. Mm. Latest polling showed support for armed resistance at forty six percent across the Palestinian territory. So. Uh, you know, basically, it's the it's the reverse of what I was suggesting. Is that the Palestinians themselves are saying we've had enough? Well, uh, the the key figure for me was um, among Gazans' uh, support for Hamas as a political yeah. party 22%. rose from twenty two percent in September to forty two percent in December, and now it's back to thirty four percent. So that's nowhere near a majority, is it? Um, and and there's some hope there that some some sense will come of it. I do apologise to listeners. I grabbed hold of that and those numbers and were completely wrong. Um, but it is a reflection on how Palestinians in Gaza and on the West Bank and elsewhere, I presume, in the Middle East, Lebanon, Jordan, etc., view the conflict. Um, Ireland has joined uh, South Africa in its genocide case against Israel, Jack. Yeah, this is sort of curious. Um, I've got a couple of Irish pals um, uh, who spend some time in Hong Kong, some time back in Ireland, 
Um, and they've been pretty consistent with this all the way along, that they really do see this, uh, the, the um, Israel-Palestinian question as a, uh, a reboot of their battle uh, against the British. So they're very pro-Palestinian, surprisingly so. Um, and then we get to aid coming into the uh, into Gaza, uh, and there is a great debate about what should happen to the UNRWA. It's the biggest organise biggest aid organisation in Gaza, employing thirteen thousand staff, and there are people who say, and I think you're one of them, who said that that should uh, that should cease. I mean, not that the aid should cease, but UNRWA is so hopelessly compromised that uh, it cannot be the um, biggest aid organisation in Gaza for very much longer. Yeah, no, it was a flawed organisation right from the very beginning. Um, generally, these situations are handled by um, uh, uh, United Nations um, refugee organisations, but this was set up specifically for one problem, problem, and it's been there since 1949, and it's sort of been captured, if you like, um, uh, by the... Uh, the more extreme end of um, the Palestinian people. Yeah, I get that. But what you're talking about, what other people are suggesting, is you kind of reinvent the aid wheel there. You, you, you basically would be starting afresh as, as opposed to a group who may need to be reformed and may need some changes at the top. Uh, and, and perhaps even elsewhere, um, but they have the capacity to deliver aid, and that's the most important thing. They have the capacity to deliver aid where it's most needed, and if you're going to bring in a, another organisation to do it, they're going to start have to start from from fresh, from from, from nothing. Uh, and uh, and I don't, you know, giving aid is not, you know, just to turning up with a truck. Um, no, it's a little um, bit more complicated than that. <laughs> and uh, uh, Hamas have been allowed not to, um, and the Palestinian Authority um, in the West Bank have been allowed not to perform the usual requirements of government, uh, and that, and they publicly say this that we don't have to worry about doing things like providing yeah. education and health and roads and picking well, they, up the they road, actually up. say. I forget the number that they apply to it, but they say these people are refugees and they're not our responsibility. Yeah, therefore, uh, the, uh, UNWA, the <laughs> United, United Nations Reliefs and Work Organisation, um, takes the responsibility for all of that. And that means that the Palestinian Authority and Hamas are free to do nothing else, really, but to wage war on yeah. Israel. Yeah. Um, and that's a mistake. That's a fundamental mistake. Um, that has to be addressed. And the only way I think it can be addressed is getting rid of UNRWA, UNRWA and getting something else in there. All right. Now, back to the – well, not back to, but uh, looking at the United Kingdom, particularly Scotland. Um, now, there are, there are laws that have come in place there today. We'll get to their um, – uh, their uh, salutations by cannon fire shortly. Um, but uh, the Scottish laws have, have been introduced. They're, they're new hate crime laws and they're coming to force. J.K. Rowling and Elon Musk, predictably among its critics. Um, uh, but we just want to have a look at what those laws are. I've got to write about this uh, over the next uh, 24 hours. Uh, this is called the Hate Crime and Public Order Scotland Act 2021. So it's been implemented by the Scottish Parliament um, and uh, under the, the under the UK system, it would be separate uh, to, well, it would be re restricted to Scotland. Uh, it creates a new crime of stirring up hatred, for want of a better term, relating to age, disability, religion, sexual orientation, transgender identity, or being into sex. The maximum penalty is a prison sentence of seven years. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that will never, ever be used, the maximum penalty. A person commits an offence if they communicate material or behave in a manner that, and I quote, a reasonable person would consider to be threatening or abusive. Now, reasonable person line, Jack, with the intention of stirring up hatred based on the protected characteristics. Stirring up hatred based on race, colour, nationality or ethnicity uh, was already illegal in Great Britain under the Public Order Act 1986, but 
in an attempt to streamline the criminal law in Scotland, that too is now part of the Hate Crime Act. So these laws sort of kind of exist in in, uh, in Great Britain, which includes, which is England and Wales. Um, in England and Wales, as I say, stirring up hatred over race, religion or sexual orientation by threatening behaviour remains illegal. The hate crime law in Scotland includes more protected characteristics. We did sort of look at this, and I don't want to trivialise it, but this is a little bit like what happened to Sam Kerr, that because she allegedly called a police officer a white bastard or a white copper, we're not quite sure which, then the offence that a person or Sam Kerr may have committed, which is a public order offence, being drunk in public or something like something of that order, becomes oh, aggravated. Parking a tiger in the back of a taxi. <laughs> well, you know, let's call that <laughs> offensive behaviour, and um, uh, and and because she used the term white when describing the police officer, that becomes an aggravated offence uh, that can lead to a jail term. So what we're looking at in terms of the way uh, the UK generally deals with um, public order offences is basically. If you've got no record, you get a slap on the wrist, they take you back to the police station and caution you um, at, at best, or at, at worst, I should say. But now, if you use the word white, black, green, or some uh, okay. some, ver- some, se- some, some gender-based um, uh, epithet, uh, then you're looking at an aggravated offence which comes with a jail term. So this is sort of carrying on from a lot of this, isn't it, that, that we're – that we're, regardless of what you think about this, I mean, the Scottish coppers are sitting back waiting uh, waiting for uh, for complaints to be to be made and they're expecting literally hundreds. Uh, and I, I suspect J.K. Rowling would be in the gun for a lot of that stuff. But what we're actually asking as a society is to say, well, where we have fundamental differences in our society, what we want to do is criminalise offence and then leave it to the, you know, the, the the heavy hand of the criminal justice system to resolve it, rather than uh, rather than having discussions, having conversations, and understanding that some of some of those conversations are going to be appalling, are going to be offensive, uh, um, um, but we don't really want to be putting that putting that person in the dock. Uh, and sending them off to prison or subjecting them to some sort of fine or conviction? Um, it's using the law um, as a tool to do something for which it's entirely ill-suited. Yeah, keep going. I mean, this, I mean, there was a point made in um, uh, in, in the Oz today from, from Hugh Rifkin, actually first published in The Times, that this is a Twitter spat that has now become a law. Um, and, and so a lot of the... A lot of the rhetoric around it is around transgender rights and so forth, but it's not just that. It's it's a lot bigger than that, uh, where people can um, profess hatred for a group of people on gender grounds, on race and ethnicity, on religious grounds. And because we have these fundamental disagreements, we think the best way to deal with them is, is to have people charged. I, I just don't get it. Well, firstly, no one's got a right not to be offended. Yeah, I think that's that's the first thing you've got to say, um, that a lot of stuff, if you spend any time on Twitter, you will become offended. There's no doubt about that. I was offended this morning looking at one particular guy's posts. Um, but that doesn't mean that I want that guy locked up. Yeah, for goodness sake, don't come to my corner of the globe if you don't want to be offended. <laughs> well, that's that, 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 that's okay, but look, good. let's let, let let's. How do we deal with fundamental disagreements in our society? You just I mean, let them look, play. You just let them play out. The law is a terrible tool for these sort of things. This is where people get in trouble with the with what they do with the law is to think the law can fix a whole lot of things which mm. it just cannot. Yeah, agree. Um, uh, agree. And, um, and uh, look, I, I might have believed the law could fix some of these things and, but before I spent 40 years 
practicing law. Um, but once you have, you understand it's a terrible tool for these sort of social um, to, to achieve social <laughs> ends. Like it's a terrible tool for a lot of reasons. And, and, and let's look at possible scenario. Let's say that J.K. Rowling is charged under these laws to speculate that that far, um, or indeed anybody, any other individual. Has she, for, she has she has challenged the no, uh, Scottish government come to and get do me. so. Yeah, so yeah. she's already in. I'm a hero mode, right? Mm. So, so the 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 act of prosecuting a, a person like J.K. Rowling, or, or or indeed someone else who was anti-trans or was uh, 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 was a misanthrope in some in some way, um, they become they become celebrated. In, mm. if, if you have these fundamental disagreements, the people who who they stand with will 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 celebrate that person's actions. Yes, under under these under these laws, and that's it's that's the, essentially the, what's the, wrong with them. Well, it's the, it's the rule of unintended consequences. Um, this, this sort of stuff's just a nonsense. It's pe- people who don't understand what the law does and what it can't do, mm. um, uh, and uh, they're always a bad idea. Um, it doesn't matter which. Political party or whereabouts it's being done, yeah. they're always about it. Look, the, the the best thing that can happen, and I actually strongly believe in this. Um, it's one of the reasons I debated John Ruddick because he and I f- fundamentally disagree on almost everything, uh, and yet we we should be able to stand in the same room and argue and discuss and converse. And I think that's or, really or, important or, for people even, to understand. Or, or even re- record a podcast. Um, indeed. You know, you and I don't agree on everything and there are times when you offend me terribly, Jack, but I don't want you locked up. Not yet. Yeah. Not yet anyway. Um, <laughs> no, no, seriously, there's the other way of looking at this is that we constantly look at police, not just the criminal justice system, not just the law, that we're looking at police to perform a role that they're not capable of. Right? This is yes, the other thing. Um, so, so the um, I guess the pro-Israeli uh, people who every every weekend in London now there's uh, pro-Palestinian marches, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and the pro-Israeli people are, are constantly berating the police to say, "Look, you police us about holding up an Israeli flag and all that sort of stuff." You know, they actually arrest them just to get them out of the way, really. Um, uh, but you won't. You know, people holding up swastikas and all that sort of stuff, and you and you don't do anything about that at all. So all this does is put the police in an, in, in an impossible position. But the police have a, have a, their own problem to deal with. Absolutely, with this absolutely. Because they have they have given up policing property crime, for instance. Yeah, that's right. Uh, um, so the, and and yes, let me go a little bit further. Yes, in fact, you know what we're talking about here um, in Scotland is if you have uh, your car broken into or your house broken into an item stolen, like Australia, uh, police are saying to us, well, give give us give this one three hundred number a call and report it. It won't be investigated, um, you know, but not as if we're going to send Hercule Poirot out to sort this out um, and no one ultimately will be charged. And we'll, we'll issue you with a number that you can take with your insurance. Now, that would seem to me to be a fundamental role that the police are not doing. Yeah, uh, so, and- so they're, de- they're decriminalising uh, property crime, property crime, you know, like domestic well, property effectively, crime. Well, effectively, yeah. Yeah, um, and they're criminalising speech, and that's just exactly it's the wrong way about it. It's a completely wrong way to go about it, um, mm. and, and, and this is, this is the, the big part of the problem. Again, you have every right to be offended, every right to be offended, but it's not a crime. No, you haven't mm. suffered a crime and you've been offended. If you have been subject to violent rhetoric and threatening rhetoric, there the law is already in place to deal with that. Mm. Um, uh, and, and and in any in any event, you've got you know if, where a realistic threat exists, um, uh, the police can act. Now, I would say because perhaps they're doing. Uh, things that they're not designed to do. They're not very good at these sorts of prosecutions or not very good at these sorts of investigations, and I've got a fair bit in the back of my mind about all of that. Um, do, you, uh, do, you, do you think it's because it, it's more comfortable to be sitting in front of the computer policing people's Twitter feeds 
than actually getting the boots on and um, uh, going out in the street and trying to find out who broke into my house and stole my telly. <laughs> well, this this happened a while back. You might remember there was there was great concern about what they call hotspot areas uh, in in and around Sydney CBD, and this was before the lockdown, so so it's going back that long, and. They said to them basically, well, the, the, not they, but the, the uh, Bureau of Criminal Statistics in New South Wales said, look, if you police these hotspot areas by putting boots on the ground, as it were, mm. police patrols in these areas, um, then you will have a reduction of crime overall. It's not as if you shovel it somewhere else, but these are mm. hot spots and they lead to assaults and robberies and you know muggings and things like that. Um, and the police just said, oh, mate, that means we'll have to get out of the car. Mm. <laughs> you know? So so there is this – look, there is, a, there is a, a, an unnatural relationship too between government and police and law enforcement mm. where the, you could argue that the law enforcement uh, element, the agencies there, have more power than government. And we saw this through the through the pandemic, with the, with, with the government saying, well, "Look, you know, we're going to have lockdown, so that means we're going to have to have penalties for people who don't observe them." And the cops said, "Yeah, well, more powers, thank you very much." Mm. And all, but all they could ever do was fine people or arrest them, um, and, and that's all they can ever do. So it's 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 a, it's a really imperfect solution. Uh, to by the by, by the way, my telly's quite safe. We're on the eighth floor, so you're gonna have to climb up a fair way. And, um, uh, <laughs> oh, well, you're, in, you're in. I hope you're not paying too much on house contents insurance, mate, because you're never going to get knocked off. Although, well, you know, if you show me the if you show me the plans to the building, I'll, we'll find a way. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, look, let's try and be reasonable about this. Understand, yes, you're going to get offended. Uh, if you spend enough time on social media, and maybe that's part of the problem too, um, uh, you're going to be offended. Or, or if you, or if you hang out with people like uh, uh, some of my mates who, are, who will take the light in offending you. But yeah, that's right. So there is this kind of sense that it's a sort of cesspit of cesspit of insult. But being insulted, it's, it's you, fun. you are not a victim of a crime <laughs> if you've been insulted. All right, and I'll be writing more about that. So if you disagree with me, folks, um, perhaps don't buy the Australian tomorrow, but um, uh, uh, or, or indeed Thursday. Sorry, it'll be Thursday the fourth. Uh, Canada, Jack. Uh, it looks like the um, the Trudeau government is on its last legs, Jack. Um, it um, is. Um, it's 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 cactus, uh, and it it's is, a reminder yeah. that um, you know, we, we look at say the the. The Tory government in the in the UK, uh, and they're in the same boat. Um, uh, and that the Morrison government was here. This is not always about ideology or one political side or the other. Sometimes governments just want to steam. Yeah, they do. If they've been in power for long enough, we call it the fag end. It's a it's a, perhaps a, a, a an old fashioned term, the fag end of government, and uh, and and people realise that. You know, within government, that they're that they're doomed, that they're going to get the baseball bats um, hmm. um, out. So, what do the Liberals, Tories, or sorry, what do the Canada's Tories have to offer, Jack? Oh, just a fresh approach. Yeah, I mean, is there and, anyone uh, there who excites you, who who, um, who who gets up and makes a good speech, or is it just the fact that they're just going to fall into power? Uh, no, Pierre Polyvere. Um, Poliev, the new leader, um, is um, sharp, good communicator. I've seen him um, a few I, times. Yeah, he's yeah, a bit he, of a libertarian, he, isn't he? Which is a kind of very lazy sort of thing, yeah. particularly from a political person to be a- adopting. It's going, oh, you know, well, well, it's just a small role in government, which sounds great. But then you know that they're going to they're going to be they want they want big government in certain areas. Yeah, um, he but he looks like uh, a safe <laughs> pair of hands, and he will um, uh, guide them into a, a, a resounding election win. I think until the next election, and, mm. um, and then we'll uh, take off from there. Jack, you love your stall gift, don't you? Did you manage to pick it up in Hong Kong? Uh, yeah, it was it was renamed the trans the, the stall transgender day visibility stop, gift. Stop! You're offending uh, me. 
um, uh, the, um, but the, for, the, for the first time in a long time, they actually pinged a runner for running dead. Oh, uh, when is, has that ever happened before? Uh, yes, yes. Who would have believed that, that a player, that, that, a, that a, a runner in the stool gift would have been turning up pretty ordinary performances and then suddenly find a few metres? <laughs> um, uh, to, to explain to our listeners, the, the, the stool gift was always a, 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 a professional um, uh, race where money was offered. Now, money, the prize money is pretty good, but it's not about that. It's about the gambling uh, that goes on around the runners. Now, I haven't been but there the for a long time. The prize money was very good. It was 25000 back in the um, back in the 70s when they could buy you a house, you know. Yeah, yeah. So it's always been pretty big, but the real money is in the gambling. Yeah. So I'm a, a mate, of, uh, mate of my old man's uh, Herbie Matthews, Brendan Matthews. Uh, he was a sprinter, a uh, lovely black Brendan. Herbie and um, and Jack and I were watching him at the stall gift uh, there in the qualifying races, and <laughs> Jack turned to me and goes, "Geez, he looks like he's running backwards." Mm. Uh, <laughs> in order to have a pretty poor performance, boost his price up, and have a bit of a lash, so his uh, his um, connections could have a bit of a lash. So this happens a fair bit, um, and on this weekend, Tom Pelo was the subject of a massive plunge on Saturday morning, coming in from two hundred to one uh, to even money. Well, worse than even money, buck seventy five, Jack, before yeah, the start of the heats at Central Park, and, and um, he'd been he'd been running um, uh, uh, fourteen seconds. Uh, 14 seconds. You and I could do fourteen seconds for the for the well we could have once for the hundred and twenty meters at store, um, and uh, and all of a sudden he turns up on the Saturday and runs twelve too far, um, <laughs> uh, and the uh, and the the stewards thought well he's taking a piss a bit here so we're going to scrub him out. Well, they they just DQ'd him and yeah, uh, subject to any penalty. Uh, I don't know, don't know about a penalty, but but he was uh, he he didn't get get to run in the semis in the final. Yeah, it was always the thing. Professional sprinting in Australia, um, obviously, the in the days when the Olympics and the Commonwealth Games were all uh, all the participants there were amateurs. Um, yes, it was. Uh, there was a fair amount of dodgy stuff going on there in the my, professional. My, my favourite one was the my favourite one was the, to wear the heavy shoes in the um, uh, in the heat. Oh yes, yeah, so well you'd have sort of lead in the boots, so to, so to speak, yeah, yeah, lead, yeah. lead in the shoes and the running yeah. shoes. Yeah, that'd do it. Yeah. Um, so who, who won? Who won? Oh, um, I, I, I'm not sure who the. Um, oh, uh, the, come on, Jack! You love a store gift. Yeah, um, I'll find but, uh, out. We'll so, find some, out. Some some twenty year old twenty year old fella called from Hoppers Crossing called Endale McComan, um, who ran uh, who ran twelve oh seven. And did he- oh no, he was the he was the favourite, but the fellow who won because we had the had the torrential rain. Yeah, um, uh, and and, and uh, but the bloke who won was a, a wet weather specialist. They run on run on the grass at still. Jack Lacey, so, yeah, Jack Lacey from Melbourne claimed the mm. crown at uh, and Chloe Mannix Power was the. Uh, was the women's winner, uh, and and it was run in torrential rain, hmm. uh, which leads us on to our sports coverage of the AFL, Jack, because uh, uh, the uh, the Cats and the Hawks did battle yesterday and they got the three-quarter time. They were about to kick off the last quarter and they had to go inside because there was uh, threats of lightning strikes and then it did pour down. So that rain has made its way from Stall all the way to Melbourne. Uh and uh, the cats uh, with uh, uh, well, the cats ended up the the, the winners there um, <clears throat> with uh, Hawkins uh, um, uh, playing his three hundred fiftieth game and <laughs> looks like he's looks like he's played about fifty. He's in very good shape and still a very powerful forward. Um, Geelong have got <clears throat> I think they've got the three wins now, no losses, um, and. Uh, the big issue, Jack, is uh, the Brisbane Lions. Last year's grand finals, they played Collingwood uh, on the Thursday night uh, and uh, I tipped uh, the Lions. They looked like pretty good things, but they were beaten well by Collingwood, who found a bit of form, beaten by 20 points. So the Gabba as a fortress has gone down, but there are other problems in the club, Jack. Yeah, it seems that not all the players, but a number of the players went on a, an end-of-season trip uh, to I think um, uh, Los Angeles and Nashville uh, last year at the end of the season, 
Yeah. And, and there, were, and, there were other other players there as well. I saw a photo and I was pretty sure that was Isaac Smith, the former Hawthorne and Geelong um, uh, premiership player. They do do a bit of this intra-club travel. I know um, I know Zach Smith was uh, uh, used to go and play golf with a, with a few St Kilda players. Yeah. In yeah. the States. I, but partly back because a lot of these young fellas have played – Junior sport together and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, you know? yeah. And you'll, you'll, not, you'll notice this at the end of an AFL game. Um, as soon as the siren goes, people are catching up quickly with people who that they probably won't see for another few weeks, um, but they're close friends. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so there seems to be, in the case of Brisbane, there seems to have been um, some consternation. I'm not sure how much I believe and how much of it is uh, sort of AFL journalism out of control. Um, but uh, the, the 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 accusation is that um, uh, th- there was some sort of misconduct there, and it's led to a, a, a led to a few of the players having uh, difficulties at home, shall we say? Um, there was a, a report that um, one of the players linked his um, WhatsApp account to his iCloud uh, account. And so the internal WhatsApps that they were send, sending amongst the group over in the United States were picked up by uh, one of the partners, partners etc. Back in, uh, or a number of the partners, possibly yeah. back in uh, in Brisbane, um, and that led to the fracturing of some uh, partner relationships, shall we say? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, again, I I, I always look at this from a point of view of how some sort of media. Our, our media coverage of AFL, shall we say, off-field issues is, is, can be a bit sort of scandalous in itself. So, I mean, the, the answer with all of these things is, and, and we know this from you know from being in sports teams and sports clubs, is you never really know what's happening from the outside. You've really got to be on the inside to know what's what's exactly happening. Right. What's happening there? Exactly yeah. right. The other but, thing there is, has this affected performance? Well, again, that we know this from, from playing sport and being involved in sports clubs, is that you, you always have people who you are playing sport with who you don't much like. Yeah. If, so you, if, you, if you play a team happen. sport. Yeah. yeah well, you were talking about how friends are formed through junior competitions and so forth. But, but basically, AFL clubs, you know, <laughs> It's not always done by invitation. Um, there, there's a draft. There's recruiting, there, you know, and and, and good list management is about getting personalities right too. But but it's not always possible. No, 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 no. And um, it, how bad a person can you be? Um, uh, well, it depends how good good a player you are. <laughs> it's the well, I was, I was just going to say. I mean, this wouldn't be an issue for the Brisbane Lions if they they won one one game, if, or if they win the next one they they play. Yeah. All of a sudden, that stuff just sort of disappears. I mean, Collingwood were the talk of the comp last week um, because they were uh, um, uh, zero three or zip three down, um, but they've had a win and uh, all's good again. Yeah, yeah, and and people will put up with a lot more if you've got some talent. You know, you look at um, say Clayton Oliver, who had some issues over the summer. The club worked very, very hard with him, and they've done a good job. He's playing great footy and all that sort of stuff. Uh, would they have worked that hard if he'd been their thirty fourth best player? Probably not. Yeah, exactly right. Um, look, I just did want to touch on how you know we mentioned the, the, the front end of the program. Richmond very, very good. This brought the pressure. Sydney Swans. We, we've spoken about elite kicking team, and and uh, from watching the game, and I watch it pretty closely. Richmond just brought that pressure mm. on a bigger ground than the SCG at the MCG, and um, and I would say the Sydney Swans turned the ball over probably more. Uh, <laughs> on Sunday than they did in their first three games. Yeah, they, they, they did, did manage to rattle um, uh, six goals in a row off, but then uh, sat back and watched as um, uh, as Richmond um, sent five through the other way. So, um, I'm, I'm just going through my tips. Good performance from Richmond. I'm going through my tips here, and, and there were a few a few upset, uh, a few uh, odd results. Uh, Melbourne beat Port Adelaide in Adelaide. I didn't think. That was possible, but they showed a fair bit. Um, gee, Max Gorn was good, um, best on ground for mine, and um, it shows that they're still they are still a real threat. Um, that's a that's a reminder of how important Brody, Brody Grundy was in the season opener. 
Yeah, look, Mac, yeah, Mac, Max, Max was back to his very, very Max, best and got Max plenty of support Mac, from his midfield. I think it was he, a big game for um, uh, for Viney, um, who's got you know long connection with the Melbourne Footy Club through, through his dad. Um, he played, I think, two hundredth game. It was yes, two hundredth game. But uh, my view is that Max is probably the most influential player on his side of any player in the Of anyone, yeah, I think so. Uh, I think that's about right. Um, yeah, look, that, it was a good result for Melbourne. And Port Adelaide will be very, very difficult to beat there and just about anywhere um, uh, for the remainder of the system uh, of the season. The other one I want to have a quick look at was Essendon and St Kilda. I, I don't think we're quite sure where either club is at the moment, but it was a very good win from Essendon, who just oh, looked to be a bit outgunned but, but got the job done. Essendon are much better than last year. Yeah, definitely they've improved. Just where St Kilda are, it's hard to know. Um, and, and, and look, we do have this problem, Jack, Western Bulldogs – and it was a very predictable game, but uh, West Coast Eagles kicked us the 30 points for the game at Marvel with the roof shut, um, uh, and uh, and and they look like wooden spooners by some considerable measure. Mm, they do. Um, I was, and, I was, and, I was I talk, talking to a talking to a North Melbourne fan uh, yesterday afternoon. He said, "Ah, oh, well." As, as, as do we play West Coast twice? I want to get a couple of wins at least. You know, yeah, look if you if you near near about you know if you're a final eight team and you do actually get to play the Eagles twice, you'll be rubbing your hands together. Um, look, North uh, North, I thought I was quite impressed with them. They hung in there against Carlton um, pretty much all game and. Um, Continue to bring the, the heat. Uh, they, they are missing a couple of defenders, tall defenders, and when the ball came in pretty quickly into Kerno and, and Harry Mackay, who's uh, having a belter of a season so far, um, they just were unable to cope. But they, they, were, they were very good, very good around the footy, uh, and they've still got a few weapons up forward. Um, they're, they're, there's a lot to like about the way they're going about it. They haven't had a win yet, of course. Neither have Hawthorne, of course, the Eagles. Um, but uh, as it stands, at the Giants who had the bye, probably the best performed team so far. Geelong not far away, uh, and, uh, and Melbourne have had three wins from their four games. Sydney uh, three wins from their four. <coughs> Carlton undefeated after just the three. Uh, yeah, hard to know where the Bulldogs are either. Right? That's an- that's another one's bit of a mystery because their best footy is as good as it gets almost, and and plenty um, of talent. Don't defend. Yeah, they, 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 but their worst is a long way off too. So, um, in the NRL, Jack, uh, we had the rabbits, <laughs> poor old suffering, long suffering rabbit O's fans, uh, saw their side come up with a win, albeit against the Bulldogs. Um, <clears throat> and uh, just a quick look at that ladder. Um, has the Dolphins on top, Jack? Now, I was bad. I was thinking, gee, they're going to have a second. They're going to have a second season. They might have the second season blues, but uh, they've had two wins from uh, three games. The Panthers look very strong. The Cowboys look very, very strong too. Uh, Roosters went up and down, but and they had a loss on the weekend, But um, as did the Raiders, but uh, they'll be thereabouts when the whips are cracking. And I keep looking at St George and thinking, what is wrong with that club? There must be something very seriously wrong with that club. They need you back again, mate. Uh, well, I was only running the website, mate. It wasn't very much. I do remember interviewing the, uh, I think it was something like 35 players on the list at that time and said, what, so, and one of the questions was, what do you do uh, when you're not a training or not playing rugby league? And they said, there were like about 75% of them said, oh, PlayStation, you know, mm-hmm. sitting in, sitting on the couch <laughs> in front of the big telly. And, that, and, and probably some of them were at least just too shy to tell me that they're gambling. Um, mm. They have a lot of time on their hands, uh, the NRL this is, boys, this, this, probably this not is, as much as they did back in that back in those days. This is, this is a reminder that um, uh, when they talk about professional sports having a recreational drug, drug problem, it's what they really mean is they've got a money and time problem. They've got yeah, too that's, much of that's it. Yeah, we did have a bit of a – well, we, we, we probably should very briefly just – Discuss what happened uh, around Melbourne with uh, whatever Melbourne Footy Club in um, in regard to the AFL. It, the allegations made by Wilkie in the uh, in the Parliament, the House of Reps, uh, would indicate that the AFL is engaged, and they haven't denied it. Uh, in, engaged in um, 
uh, uh, secret drug testing of individuals who may or, who may or may not have have a bit of a history of uh, recreational mm. drug t- testing. The the only problem I, I see with that they've got issues around it. I know, and and I sort of made the point in a column I wrote on Friday that that if you um, uh, you know, if you have probably right that uh, the, the the level of recreational drug use among AFL players is much lower than the, the than the rest of the community, that's okay. The problem you've got is when you when you are sort of permitting or legitimising recreational drug use in competition. That's the big problem because that's when you get your finger on the scales in terms of in terms of results. You know, you you can't have blokes who are on stimulants. On the on the day of uh, on the day they're playing, uh, while others yeah, are but, not. But we need to have a we need to make that distinction between um, uh, having a bit of having a bit of a toot at the party um, uh, and and getting fired up before a game. I, I, I would find it very hard to believe that players were on the toot, so to speak, on on game day mm. before a game. But it's not so; it doesn't happen. Um, I would find it very hard to believe. All right, Jack. Well, that just about takes us out. You haven't been watching the IPL? Um, no, I haven't. Mitchell Stark has been spanked because he was on the big money, of course. He's uh, he's only bowled the eight overs and they reckon he's on about $40,000 a ball mm-hmm. and he's been belted to all parts of the ground. Um, no, I think none for four, none for fifty, and then none for sort of forty-five. I think in his two games, um, I've been trying to keep an eye on that, but the trouble is that the games kick off about one o'clock in the morning; they don't finish till about five. Mm. Um, um, but we'll try and bring that to you, Jack. You got something to take us out? Yeah, this is on uh, on Twitter. Um, uh, uh, over Easter, there's a, a poster who calls himself Jesus H Christ, and he was having a great deal of fun. Uh, uh, posting like on the Easter. Sunday. How was uh, no. this Friday, though? Yeah, well, um, yeah, the, the, the Thursday was good. Um, this is on Easter Thursday. Waitresses making us all sit on the same side of the table. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Which, which I well, rather like. How, how would Leonardo be able to paint them otherwise? Yeah. Uh, and we, which I rather like. The other one comes from Ireland, um, and it's a story about a... Um, uh, uh, a wife who's sitting at home, and the police turn up at the door with her husband's driver's license, and 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 say, you know, is this your husband? You know, this is his driver's license. She said, yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, and 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 the copper says, uh, it looks like he's been hit by a bus. And she says, yes, but he's great with the kids. <laughs> there you go. All right, that takes us out. Um, uh, and look, we do apologise. Before we go, we just want to apologise. Um, we've had a few little post production issues, and um, and it means uh, uh, just for the last couple of weeks that we've been very slow in getting out to our beloved listeners. Um, well, that will be rectified over the next couple of weeks. Our much loved pro- uh, producer has had COVID, and uh, and got he got a, he got the Northern Rivers version. Jack, you don't want that. No, uh, you wouldn't. Want, you don't want anything from the Northern Rivers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we do apologise to listeners, and we look forward to bringing you an edition next week. And that's all from us. I'll see you later, Jack. Last time I was in Byron, I felt like walking around handing out cakes of soap. Um, there you go. <laughs> All right, see ya. <laughs>